You're listening to the Listen Up Show, Startup Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm Mitchell Chadro, your host. Today on show 013. Today, we're here with Mike Templeman. Failure should not be something that you say, yeah, I failed. Failure should be something that just stings. I mean, just makes you a miserable sack. And if it does, then I think you're going to learn from it, and it's going to be strong and pertinent enough to actually stick with you. And so when I think of failure, I've got a couple that come right off the top of my head. One of them was trusting people. I trusted people to do what they said they would do and to abide by unwritten uh, rules and by unwritten agreements and these types of things, and was stabbed in the back summarily numerous times. And I'm a very trusting person. And now I live with a very healthy dose of skepticism to where I would say I am pretty much cynical about a lot of things. And it's okay because you kind of need that in business because there really is an entire underbelly of the business world that is looking to take advantage of the unsuspecting. So listen up, trusted friends. It's your business. It's your family. It's your life. Now let's get started. Please sign up to my email list for the latest special offers exclusive for our Listen Up Show Startup Entrepreneur Podcast audience at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. I have been providing business advice, resources, and help to entrepreneurs for over 20 years, and I'm looking forward to helping all of you. Sign up for my email list, again, at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. I will provide you with full transcript for each interview, my ebook, 30 Tools to Start Up, the Startup Checklist, and many other education and training materials, all back at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. Now enjoy the show. Okay, we're here today with Mike Templeman. Mike is an entrepreneur. He's a writer who enjoys writing about startup and scaling service-based businesses and, and all things content marketing. He's also the founder of Foxtail Marketing, which is actually a digital demand generation firm. Locations in Canada, Australia, London, New York City, just, just to name a few, right, Mike? That's correct. Yeah, super. You, you actually have columns in Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazine. Uh, but, Mike, why don't you fill in some of the gaps? Tell us a little bit about you, both personally and professionally, to give us some insight so that the audience can, can learn a little bit more about you. Okay. So I started off uh, in Canada. I'm actually Canadian by birth and moved down to uh, Georgia where I kind of grew up and then uh, migrated over to Utah where I ended up marrying a Utah gal and am now here. But uh, with that, it professionally started in the marketing departments of some companies, launched my own venture back in 2009, was able to sell that in 2013, and then rolled the profits from that into the agency, Foxtail, and was able to bootstrap it and grow it without, uh, you know, adding anybody to the cap table, which was kind of a focus for me at that point. Uh, I had a very messy cap table with my previous engagement and really wanted to just do something on my own. And that's, uh, you know, been great uh, for growth. We are... Uh, well above 60 employees now and growing uh, aggressively and, and really looking to bring something different to the, uh, the digital marketing landscape. Our startup round. For all your hosting needs, head on over to mitchellchadro.com slash hosting. mitchellchadro.com slash hosting for all your web hosting needs. Who do you use to host this website? I also noticed that just from, from all your writings and, and looking at the website that you're, you're also very much into educating consumers, your clients, and sort of taking them all the way through and taking really a, a very complex subject matter and really kind of, you know, making it simple and easy for, for people to understand. I, I noticed that you have that Foxtail University and, and your blog, you know, the, the Fox Dean. Uh, tell us a little bit about the importance of that and, and how you work with your clients and in that regard? Well, my personal opinion is an informed client is the best client. And with that being the case, we also uh, practice what we preach here. And we tell our clients when they are creating content, you've got to give till it hurts. Because if you're trying to attract people with content marketing that is very superficial and doesn't really solve their problem, you're just going to be drowned out and you're just going to sound like everybody else. Instead, what we tell them is show them how the sausage is made. Tell them exactly how you do everything. And the truth of the matter is most people are coming to you because you're so good at what you do, not what you do, if it's a service uh, company. And for that matter, we, we 
teach people everything we do. All of our tactics are available for download online via eBooks, or if you can go to our uh, Foxdale University section, you can learn, learn, learn. We do trainings with our existing clients. And while I am not a gifted writer by any stretch, I suck at uh, grammar and, you know, just <laughs> I don't really, uh, I'm not really a great uh, writer from a structural point of view, I can tell a story. And what I, what I do think is one of my strengths is I'm able to take complicated ideas and wrap them into a metaphor that pretty much anybody can pick up, and I like teaching that way. So that's what a lot of my writing does, and it's very, I would say, uh, irreverent sometimes. Uh, Forbes does try and tone me down quite a bit. Uh, Entrepreneur is a little bit more open to my personality, but, uh, you know, it comes out, and, it, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Sure. You know, it, it's interesting. We, we just had uh, Scott uh, Pecorello on um, our last podcast, and one of the things that he said is everybody's good at something. Focus on what you're good at. And, and from what I heard from you, you know, you're good at sort of, you know, telling that, that story and, and not necessarily grammar and, and, and other uh, nuts and bolts with, that come with the writing, but there's, there's something that, that people are good at. And so we're, we're talking to a lot of entrepreneurs and, and trying to motivate them to sort of either start or grow or scale up that business. I mean, you already now have success. This is being your second business. How, how did you do that with the, with the first business, uh, you know, basically scale it up? turn it around, sell it, and then take some of those profits and, and start the digital content marketing firm that you now have that you've grown to 60 employees? Well, honestly, my first company was a nightmare. Um, I did not run it well. It, I made so many mistakes in, in retrospect. It was a big learning experience. I had failure after failure, uh, but was luckily able to build something that still generated revenue and grew very quickly. Uh, but in hindsight, could have been so much more. And in 10 to 15 years, I hope to look back on what I'm doing now and agree that whatever I've done with Foxtail, while I might feel it is uh, adequate sometimes, it, I could be doing so much more. And the goal is just to keep learning and growing from those mistakes. So really, I don't even value the money that was made from the sale of the last organization, but more so the experience that I received. And I have gained immense amounts of experience in what I'm currently doing as well. And it helps me grow and learn and know what I'm not going to do and what I am going to do in the future. And I think that that's, uh, that, that, that was really the most valuable thing I was able to get out of it. When helping entrepreneurs, and in this case, what you do is SEO, and we'll get into that in a little bit, you know, one of the things that the entrepreneurs are learning from, the new startups, are other people's failures and what they've actually learned from it so that they don't obviously have to go through those same types of things and they can sort of gain that wisdom and sort of be a little bit more ahead of the game, if you will. So take us through, and it could have been your, your last endeavor that it sounds like in all, all all uh, aspects, you know, you, you were able to obviously, you know, make a profit even though you didn't use that as, as the measuring stick of your success. But, but maybe tell our audience a little bit about, you know, your lowest point as an entrepreneur, as a business person, and what you actually learned from it and, and maybe some takeaways so that the audience can sort of gain from that as well. And, 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 and in doing so, can, can learn, learn a little bit more about you and the organization that you've now built into this successful agency? Yeah, well, whenever I think about it, and, you know, I wrote an article on Forbes a little bit ago called Let's uh, Knock It Off With All The Failure Praising, just because while I do aspire to, to learn from my failures and I do um, think that people should learn as quickly as possible from their failures, I feel like with Silicon Valley and the rise of, the, the 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 conversations and uh, the you know the 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 uh, narrative around failure it, it's shifting from being something that should be really a negative that comes into a positive it people are viewing it as a positive that's a positive and mm -hmm. I think it still should be viewed as a negative but you have to learn from it and it can turn into a positive a lot of people kind of wear these failures on their sleeve and say yeah you know raised a ton of money failed the company, but I've learned a lot of stuff into the next thing. Well, I don't think you should really be talking about that. I think you should be talking about, you know, yes, share people, share with people the, the failure, the story of the failure, but embrace it for what it really was. And the reason I say that is because I read all these posts on Medium and on, uh, I find them on Twitter all the time, of founders who have run their companies into the ground and they give their what I learned speech. And it's mm -hmm. always the same damn thing. 
oh, watch your burn rate. Actually build a company people want to pay for. Don't uh, focus too much on marketing, but rather on product and stuff. And I sit there and go, of course. What are, what are you talking about? This isn't news. Thank you for the insights, but if you were reading all the other failure posts, you would have realized that you were doing all those stupid things. People like to talk about failure, but they don't actually learn from it a lot of times. And you really do – failure should not be something that you say, yeah, I failed. Failure should be something that just stings. I mean, just makes you a miserable sack. And if it does, then I think you're going to learn from it, and it's going to be – strong and pertinent enough to actually stick with you. And so when I think of failure, I've got a couple that come right off the top of my head. One of them was trusting people. I trusted people to do what they said they would do and to abide by unwritten uh, rules and by unwritten agreements and these types of things and was stabbed in the back summarily numerous times. And I'm a very trusting person. And now I live with a very healthy dose of skepticism to where I would say I am pretty much cynical about a lot of things. And it's okay because you kind of need that in business because there really is an entire underbelly of the business world that is looking to take advantage of the unsuspecting. So for that reason, I was burned in a situation where a partner of ours sent uh, some of their employees to our office to do corporate espionage, to be able to steal and use stuff against us and all these types of things. Meanwhile, they were coming under the guise of, I can't make enough money at this place, and I'm desperate for help. Can you please help me out and give me this big sob story? And, of course, believe it right out of hand and ended up being a horrible situation for us where they tried to capture all this stuff legally. And, really, they were just looking to screw us and wanted ammunition to sure. get a settlement, to, to, to let us not sue them into the Stone Age because they knew they were going to end up screwing us. So that, that led me to that. And then the second one that I've learned the most of uh, was, and, and I know it sounds terrible saying don't trust people, but I mean it all in business. Trust them as far as they're willing to sign on something. And then, you know, just get it in writing because you never know. And then the second one um, was with my last uh, company. I... I I thought the idea of raising money and bringing in investors was some form of success when really it's not. You're taking debt out on the company. Uh, you are bringing in extra cooks into the kitchen and all these different uh, uh, analogies you want to use there. But it, it made my life miserable. And while it helped us grow very quickly and I was able to scale it, I never was able to make the company what I wanted it to. So because of that, I said, you know what, on my next one, I'm rolling the dice. Yes, I'm taking a bigger chance because it is my money, but it is my company and I get to call the shots. And that's why I did it. So I don't, uh, I think nowadays yep. people think that raising money is some form of success. But, you know, there's a guy here who uh, we've worked with uh, as a client and they're one of those unicorns, Qualtrics, and their CEO, uh, Ryan Smith, likes to say, people come up to me and congratulate me on our latest round of funding, but I can't remember the last time I went and congratulated someone on getting a you know $10 million mortgage or something like that. That That's basically what it is. You're just getting into debt or you're getting all these uh, added responsibilities. And, and I think that uh, I, at the time, was not aware of how that all worked. And I think that a lot of entrepreneurs that have come up in this, uh, this summertime for uh, uh, fundraising really don't understand all the, the things that they are committing to. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, uh, that, that brings me to two quick points, and, and I'll just comment on, on your point about, you know, bringing up failures um, and, and sort of, you know, people that actually talk about their, their failures like as if it's some kind of, a, you know, a good thing. And I think that when you're, when you're talking to people like uh, the Listen Up Podcast, Trusted Friends audience here, one of the things that we kind of value the most is not only education, but but dealing with genuine people that we can trust and that we can count on. Like, you know, basically we say trust smarter. So when, when building your personal relationships, how do you know who you can count on? How do you know you can go to a, a certain person that's going to be able to help you? And one of the reasons, actually, Mike, that we had you on the show today is because, you know, a lot of people are building their websites. They're trying to sort of build their subscriber base. And there's so many talking heads out there about SEO, about content marketing, about building up, scaling up. And because of that, it's kind of hard in a very loud, crowded, noisy marketplace who we can actually count on and who we can actually trust. 
And actually, when I, I started to read some of your stuff and I started looking through it all, I could actually tell, at least that was the feeling that I got, that this was somebody that I could trust, that, that actually is someone who has built this organization, who's built this company, and someone that's actually speaking to me. And if you were doing that and speaking to me, I felt very comfortable in having you on the show because I knew that it was going to resonate with other people in the audience. So that's why I think, you know, it's good to sometimes talk about your failures. It's, it's all in the, the content of who's actually hearing it. You know, for me, it, it lets me know who you are as a human being, as a person. And when I'm building a relationship with someone like that, that's, you know, unfortunately how to go through that, but it really does tell me something about you, and it makes me trust you actually even more. Um, so anyway, for, for me, that's a good thing. Um, but, you know, you, you might look at it differently. And then your second point, I think, was very helpful to the audience, and that is bank smarter. In other words, we had a guest on that, that um, you know, that the uh, Mike Hallahan and, and Bonnie Harvey, who sold, um, who, who actually sold uh, Barefoot Wines to uh, E.J. Gallo, they said, you know, it's not all about borrowing a lot of money. Um, because at the end of the day, sometimes that's not the best way to grow your business. So look what you're doing now. You're, you're obviously not doing that. You're taking the opposite approach. And I think for young entrepreneurs out there, for people who are just starting their businesses and people who are now trying to scale up, I think that those are two very important messages, uh, and they can learn something from you um, by those failure stories. So anyway, um, that, that's my take on that. Yeah, and, and, and I appreciate that. And I think – to go along with what you were saying, raising money in, in nowadays, and what I think is the biggest issue here, is raising money will convince you that you have a product or a service that people want. Because when you have a lot of money, you don't have to worry about cash flow and customers and revenues as much. You, you have a little bit more time, so you're able to spend more on marketing. And, and if you spend enough in marketing, you can sell a really crappy service or product. But people churn out of those very quickly. They, they realize that they weren't sold a bill of goods they want, and they will eventually churn out of that. And so by building a company without venture funding or without a, a lot of outside money, it makes you very quickly iterate a product or service that people need because the only way you're going to grow is by getting customers and customers that stay. And it forces you to grow off of revenue, and revenue only comes from successfully selling your product and successfully maintaining your customer base. Whereas if you're able to raise $30, $40 million and go discover your audience, you don't know for quite a while if you even have a viable business model or a viable product. And I think what we're noticing is that a lot of these venture groups that are – venture-backed groups, rather, that are going uh, tech up right now, it, they come to the, <laughs> to the conclusion of, we were selling something no one wanted. I'm like, well – yeah, of course you were. But why did it take you four years? Well, because they raised a hundred million dollars. And I think that better products come out of bootstrap companies, and that might be, in, uh, you know, a broad statement. But I really do believe that better services and products really do come out of a bootstrap company. Yeah. No, I, I, I think I think that that's something that people out there in the audience are listening up to. Very important, and we certainly hear you loud and clear. So, given given what you've learned to date, and I've read some of these articles about you know you describe a funnel, the top of the funnel, and the the middle of the funnel, and then the call to action, and, and diagramming, and, and all the various different ways that uh, people out there who are building these websites, who are now saying, okay, now where's the traffic? And that's where someone like yourself, who actually knows how all of the, the, the pieces move together, not only on a micro level, but on a macro level, and someone that we can basically count on and trust. Maybe, to, and it, it can be a very complex subject matter, and I know you have a lot of educational materials at your site, but maybe, maybe take us through, um, just a, a little bit, maybe in a, in a more simple fashion, depending upon the, the, uh, the level of understanding that people have in the audience, and, Tell us a little bit about what you do and how that might be a little bit different than maybe some other companies and what they should be thinking about when it, when it comes to content marketing and sort of bringing traffic to their website. Mm-hmm. Well, the truth of the matter is, and I just wrote uh, an article that hasn't been published yet on this, uh, there was an article that said that the SEO industry is going to reach $65 billion in spending in 2016. And I wrote, you know, vast majority of that's going to be spent on snake oil because most Business owners and small entrepreneurs or even traditional marketers don't really understand the digital landscape. And because of that, 
you can understand how easily manipulated it is by people in the industry. And we have, for some reason, developed an entire measurement system on metrics that don't matter, keyword rankings, traffic, uh, all these things that people think they need aren't real because keyword rankings can be manipulated. They can be uh, – they're different for everybody. It's become more contextual in the sense that if you're on a mobile device or if you are uh, based on your search history or who's attached to you in certain social networks, Google and Bing will serve you up different rankings. So search rankings are – completely relative based on the individual doing the search and the, the way they are doing that search. So why look at those? Traffic numbers can be manipulated. I could send a million people to someone's website tomorrow and probably cost me about $1,000. And that doesn't mean anything. So what we did was we founded an agency on the idea that we talk in the same numbers that our clients talk, which is customers through the door, revenues. And so when we do, when we kick off a client, we say how much you need to see from this campaign to make this successful for you. And then that's the number we work towards, and that's our KPI. Now, are we still going to report to them what their traffic numbers are and what their keyword rankings? Yes. We're going to report just to give them some ideas of what's happening. But that if we're not, you know, pushing new customers and revenues to them, it doesn't matter what the, rev- what the traffic and keywords say. So people need to change the way they think about digital marketing first off, and they need to start don't worry about all the noise out there. Make marketing like any other marketing. If I spend money on this, am I going to get customers? That should be your question, and that should be your only question. Don't worry if you're going to get increased rankings, if you're going to get more traffic. That doesn't matter. So one term you've been able to yeah, – yeah. oh, go ahead. No, what I was going to say is based on your revenue model, and, again, people are coming in, you know, whether they're just starting or whether they're sort of, you know, uh, they, they've been in business for several years or looking to obviously build up or they're in the process of selling their business. Obviously, you have different revenue models for, for different people based on their budget or whatever type of solutions because you, you do offer quite a number of, you know, uh, solutions that are both – you can do really, it looks as if from your website, you can really do from A to Z, both horizontally and vertically integrated, which is another reason why I thought it was important to have you on because, you know, it seems as if you can do everything. But do you ever tie that to uh, what you charge based on the success of the customer? Uh, so, for example, you know, if I want to bring in X number of subscribers or X number of, of revenue, is that ever tied to – you know, what you actually then would go ahead and charge a customer. You, you see what I'm saying? So that, oh, yeah. so that it's truly tied to a win-win and everybody is, is, is rooting for everybody to do very well. Right. And what we found was that actually pay for performance engagements actually cause more uh, antagonism between the parties than it does collaboration. The reason being is, if I am an agency and I sign up a client that wants to do pay for, for per performance, the more success they have, the more expensive I will become towards them, and they will look for some way to exit engagement eventually. Additionally, it also opens the door for people to be dishonest in the sense that they don't want to pay for this success, or they might try and find a way that they could attribute that success to something else. And that's what Honestly, that's unfortunately what usually happens is that one of those two scenarios, the clients look to get out of the engagement because it's becoming too expensive or there's so much debate and uh, discussion over what was really attributed to those efforts and can it be traced back to this and that. It's just, it, it causes conflict right away. So we stay completely away from those. Um, what we do is we are paid to do a job. We come to our clients and we say, we do an audit, we look at them, we say, this is what you require. And yes, we do everything that is digital, videos, SEO, content marketing, social, PPC, email, all of it. Why? Because if you were going to a contractor or a carpenter, and a carpenter is the the one I use all the time, and they said, well, bring me your pieces of wood that need hammering, and then you're going to have to go down the street to the guy that does the sawing, and then the guy down the street that's going to do the painting. Or do you want to go to someone that says, I will build this for you. Here it is. Because I can use a saw. I can use a level. I can use a, a plane and all these different things that they require. And so SEO, PPC, email, marketing automation, all that stuff are just tools in our tool belt. And what we're really building for our clients is a funnel. A funnel that drives top of funnel traffic and then moves it down to convert at the bottom, which is revenue. And 
we tell our clients, based on what your goals are and how much you want to make and what you want to do, this is what your costs will be. We agree on it, and then we go forward. We work on a three-month engagement, and then it goes month to month because I want to have to earn that client's business every single month. We have 100% visibility as well, which I think is something that people don't demand enough. So our internal systems that our team uses that they log into every day and they complete work and they talk amongst each other and it's our project management and our CRM and all these tools, that's completely customer-facing. Our clients can log in and they get user access just like anybody else here. And so they can tell when stuff's being done, what comments are being made, when due dates are there, everything. They become part of the team. And that's how we make them a win-win because we don't get to keep them as a client unless they succeed. And they're, they, we need them to succeed to be happy. So they, they, both groups automatically want to win at that point as long as we're always talking about the right success metrics, which should always be revenue, new leads generated, customers, that type of stuff, as opposed to keyword rankings and traffic. Sure. You know, it, it kind of reminds me, I, I did a podcast on, you know, great apps that are out there that are low cost or no cost that people use in our audience to basically grow their business, whether it be to develop their website. But, but at this point, the reason why, again, that I've had you on is because this is the next step. I mean, you know, it's great to build a website. It's great to, to sort of do some of the other things. Um, but if you're not bringing traffic to your site, and so maybe, I don't know if you're comfortable in sharing, but, you know, you, know, you have a lot of people at, at different stages of the business, and so some are, are looking at the cost, and, and maybe they could only do one or two of the solutions. But, you know, how do you make this? affordable in the beginning uh, with with customers, with clients, so that they can obviously generate business from it because obviously their success, hopefully because they're loyal, I'm a loyal guy, so I always stick with those who, who have stuck with me, uh, but that's just my mindset. And I'm sure a lot of people in our audience feel that way as well just because that's the mindset of our, our trusted community. Um, but But what do you do to sort of, you know, uh, basically create a revenue stream that makes it more sensible, more practical for more and more consumers to sort of get involved with an agency that, you know, is as large as yours already. Right. And what we, unfortunately what I tell a lot of our consultants here, which are, you know, to another taxonomy, our salespeople, but they don't sell, they consult, is that we should be saying no more than we say yes. Because even though we can do everything, there are a lot of groups out there that should not be spending money on their marketing. And what I mean by that is there is so much bad marketing that goes on out there. And if you can only afford $500 a month, you really should not be outsourcing your marketing because what can be done for you for $500 a month if you look at it from a business-to-business -business point of view and if that other group needs to make a profit, very little can be done. Whereas that $500 if deployed internally with your own efforts can do quite a bit more. And it would be better used by getting experience, by going and reading, go to our website, read up all of our materials. And so with a lot of the smaller clients that call us, we actually send them all this material and say, listen, we're not a solution for you. We could take your money, but you're not going to be happy with the results because, quite frankly, we can't do enough work based on this budget. But here are all these training materials that we have. Please learn how to do this, how to do that, how to do this, and take that small amount of budget you have and go and deploy it much more effectively. And we hope that they can go and do that. The other customers come to us, and if they do have enough budget to come in under the line for, you know, our minimum engagements, we'll look at it and say, well, you can't pay for a full funnel engagement and do everything right out the bat and have us build everything from scrap. Let's find the things that are going to drive immediate traffic and immediate results to your site, converting traffic, that is, and customers, and let's focus on those, whether that be email, social, SEO, PPC, whatever it may be. And those clients, we come in very laser-focused, and what I tell the people here, our, our marketers and our employees, is you have to find a traction channel for your clients. And I tell every entrepreneur, what's your traction channel? Because you cannot grow without having firm footing somewhere. And they can't raise their marketing budget without finding a positive ROI. It's impossible for small companies to boil the ocean, so you have to focus. 
and you have to find a traction channel where you're able to generate revenue and able to generate customers. So very quickly, we'll lean methodology test several different things for clients. Now, luckily, we've been doing this for three years, and we've seen almost everything. There's still new stuff that comes around. And when we see something that we've already been able to succeed in, we deploy that without having to do A-B testing or uh, waste money on lean methodologies there of, uh, of uh, testing it before we deploy it. So a lot of times we already know what we're supposed to tell our clients, and we know what's going to help them, and we tell them, we'll start with this, and then let's scale it as you're able to generate revenue from this. As Once we've developed this traction channel, let's now expand into other methodologies. Sure. You know, we, we talked earlier about some of the, some of the business failures and, and what our audience is obviously going to gain from that. Uh, on the flip side of that coin, you know, by talking about some of the successes, it sounds as if that would also be extremely helpful uh, to the audience in terms of themselves as being entrepreneurs looking to sort of, you know, either start or build their business. Uh, so maybe you can take us through some of your successes Again, whether it's in your last endeavor or in the, in the current one that you're in, um, that you find uh, has been your success and, and that, you, that you feel that would be helpful to our audience as well. Mm-hmm. So what I, what I kind of preach around the office quite a bit and, and what I really aspire to is simplicity in all things. And as an entrepreneur, and I wrote an article recently on, uh, on entrepreneur.com, about I battle with depression and anxiety, which I think a lot of entrepreneurs suffer from because they're just naturally very driven individuals, but with that comes a level of positive anxiety, but anxiety cuts both ways. And it's something that runs in my family, and so I've, I've, I've always uh, dealt with that. But there's, there's something that I've come to the conclusion of, and what, I, what I've done is I've been able to introduce three different people into my life, and they're all me. There's a past me, a present me, and a future me. And when I look at it this way, I'm, I'm able to actually stay sane, have work-life balance, because I've been able to grow this company by going home at 5 o'clock every day. And by coming in, I come in a little early. And, and I've worked at night sometimes, but not that often. And it's because I have young children. I don't want to give up the best years of my life as a father to be able to give them a great inheritance down the road, I feel like I'm shortchanging them from having a good parent at the beginning. So it's always been a very big focus of mine to have work-life balance, and it is for all of my employees as well. And so what well, I'm you know, it's, it, it's, is, interesting, it's interesting that you say that, and I'll let you continue in one second here, is that, you know, in starting this podcast, we not only focus on business and entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial programs and courses and training, but the other two most important things are life, lifestyle, and, of course, family. And, you know, if you're only focused on one and to, to neglect the other two, then really what does it all mean? And so, yeah. you know, I, I think it's nice that you're saying, saying this to us because, one, it lets us know a little bit more about you and, and our audience of trusted friends you know, can see you a little bit better. But I think it's also extremely helpful because there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there who, for one reason or another, are either working for someone else who are fearful to get started because they either say to themselves, how can I do it? You know, I don't have the, you know, the backing or the money or the resources or I have a family and so I need this nine to five job and I can't really sort of start this thing up on the side. And so when they start to see and hear other people doing it and that they're successful, not that they're going to be that person, but it lets them know that, gee, I can probably do this as well. Um, So I think that that's a very powerful uh, message to everyone. Yeah, and, 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 and it's true because you read these articles about, you know, Elon Musk that sleeps in his boardroom in his offices. I mean, he's also, you know, been very public about saying he was a terrible husband and, um, his wife should have left him and stuff like that. The guy is maniacally driven. Am I that individual? I have drive, but I also want to have quality of life. And I don't think that people need to say, just because I want to build the next billion-dollar industry, I have to sacrifice everything. You can be a successful entrepreneur and still manage to have a real life. And the way I've done that is by having those three personas, past me, present me, future me. Any regrets I might have over previous business or anything or anything that happened yesterday or the day before it is done by past me. And the only thing that can bring me is usually regrets because human beings, for some reason, we regret the past and we, we, we 
uh, have anxiety about the future and instead of being happy. And really, you can only be happy in the present. So what I do is I use strict scheduling, very strict scheduling, and systems that I set up that manage me. So I don't have to manage myself because every person is lazy and every person is, the, is their own worst enemy. So I let systems manage me. So I schedule my days the day before down to the minute. And the only time I don't schedule is when I'm out of the office. When I leave the office, I'm off the clock. I don't have to think about anything, and I get to go hang out with my kids. And what's great about that is when I go home, if I go to my kid's soccer game, I'm not worried about what's happening tomorrow. I don't even think about tomorrow because that's future me, and it was already taken care of by past me. I know that he's already scheduled my day. He already has done all the things that need to be done, and I don't have to think about it. And so when I come into work the next day, present me just walks in. I don't think about a thing. I just follow my schedule. I'm not worried about yesterday. I'm not worried about tomorrow. I know what big projects are on the board. I know all of these things, but I get to be happy, and I don't have to work with the stress and the buzzing of a thousand different things flying around my head because that's handled by those other guys. So that's one strategy and one thing that I've done that I think has made me very successful. It's, it's stripped down everything that that usually causes me anxiety and stress and worry that entrepreneurs just live off of, and it made it simple. It's just I worry about what's happening right now because all the other stuff was taken care of. Did you hear that, trusted friends? A lot of value bombs that Mike just gave us, and that is if you're out there, you really can be a success and balance work, family, and life. And, you know, it's interesting, Mike, because, um, you know, our last podcast episode, we, we talked a little bit about Marcus Aurelius, who was uh, the last good Roman emperor. And basically what he said is, you know, you, you can't do anything about the, the past. You shouldn't really fret over the, the future. You, you really need to basically concentrate on what's really basically in front of you. And, and he was really way before his time. And, and he actually said that 2,000 years ago. That's what resonated with me when you were talking about your past and your present and your future. So very, very powerful and really a lot of wisdom that you provided our audience. Our fast pitch, mitchellchadro.com slash books for books, audio books, guest recommendations, and the books that I read to start up each day. Sponsors are Fast Pitch, my book club recommendations back at mitchellchadro.com slash books. To see more of my recommendations and recommendations of our guests, just go to mitchellchadro.com slash books. It's your number one resource for book reviews and recommendations. Mike, we just asked some fast questions, looking for some fast answers, and then, you know, we'll ask you, like, some parting uh, pieces of wisdom, and then maybe how everybody can basically stay in contact with you till we, we actually speak again. So tell us the best business advice you ever received. Best business advice I ever received. Hmm. Tough. I received some really good ones. I would say revenue cures everything, and I totally agree with that. A lot yeah. of people worry about all the set pieces, but honestly, if revenue is not coming in the door, none of that matters. If revenue is coming in the door, everything seems less significant. So that's sure. true. Best uh, business book? Best business book? Um, oh, it was doing hard. The hard thing about doing hard things by. Uh, um, Horowitz, uh, not Ben Horowitz. Okay, Great yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely we'll definitely have a link on that. I know just from from listening to you today on the Listen Up podcast, you know you're into quotes, so uh, that that lets me into my next uh, fast question here. And your favorite quote, saying or mantra that you kind of, you know, something that you go by every day, or you know, something that resonates with you, and and you know, will uh, will empower people. So we have uh, around our offices there are quotes over all the walls, all over the place you look, there's quotes. There's one that's right outside of our uh, break room that everybody really loves, and that is one of my favorites, and it says, change your thoughts and you change your world, because it goes back to what I was saying about simplicity and being happy in the moment. Most of the time, what you're worried about and what you're sad about, what you're anxious about, what you're all these things about, isn't even real. It's fabricated in your own head, 
and your situation doesn't dictate your mood. Your mood dictates your situation. So I love that quote. Change your thoughts. Yeah. You, you know who said that? Because I, I know that just mentioned him before, Marcus Aurelius, but he basically said something like that. So yeah. a very a very powerful quote. How about uh, an app that helps you or your customers solve issues? It could be in your personal life or your for your family, it could be for your business, um, or just something that you recommend because you know you, you've you've heard good things about it. You know what? Honestly, it's what I went back to. It's one of the simplest apps in the world, and it could be any app. But Google Calendar, I have it on my phone, I have it on my computer, and it allows me to never stress about what's coming next because I've already taken care of it. It keeps me on track. It is my assistant. It is my scheduler. It is everything. And it, I take all my worries, all my anxiety, all my stress, and I put it into my calendar, and then it manages it for me because I do at some point, and I know how to manage myself in the future, but my calendar manages it. And it's the app I use more than anything else in the world. I don't even think about it anymore because it's just become so part of my daily routine, but it's it's indispensable. Perfect. And, you know, just a, a parting piece of wisdom and then how everybody in the audience can can get in contact with you, stay in touch. And then we'll, uh, until we say goodbye. Okay. Yes, parting piece of wisdom is stop comparing yourself to everyone else. Uh, a couple of years back, I was so just worked up over the fact that my company wasn't growing X fast or that fast or this fast because all I read were headlines of billion dollar valuations and multi million dollar investments and all these things. And I just thought that's where the action is. And now my inbox and news feed is filled up with company laying off and company going under and company doesn't have a product that works because they've raised billions of dollars. What might seem really impressive one day will seem very foolish the next. And really all you can worry about is your company and your results. And that's all you should worry about. Don't worry about your competitors. Just crush them. Move forward. They're, they should be the ones worrying about you. Just do you is what I would tell people. Yeah, no, no, that's uh, that's really terrific, Mike. Our wrap-up round, MitchellChadrow.com slash photos for all your graphic design needs. And how can everybody uh, get in contact with you? So my uh, email is Mike at FoxHillMarketing.com. I give it out freely. It's on our website. I'm, I'm always happy to email people. Uh, I usually email back very, very quickly. They can always get a hold of me there. You can uh, follow me on Twitter at Mike Templeman one uh, the number one, uh, or you can uh, look up my columns on Forbes.com and Entrepreneur.com. No, no, that's, that's really super, Mike. Let me tell you, trusted friends out there, this is such an important topic and, and certainly something that everybody needs to educate themselves about and take action on. So we're really happy that we had Mike on the show today. He not only is good at what he does, but he sounds like a really good person and someone that we can trust. And, and that's what we're all looking for. So again, Mike, I just want to thank you very much for you taking the time to come on to the Listen Up podcast and talk to our, our audience. We really look forward to keeping in contact with you. We wish you all the best. Stay, stay connected to us as well. Well, I appreciate that, Mitchell. Anytime. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Sure. Hey, take care now. Bye-bye. In closing, let me ask for my listeners' help. First, please subscribe to my email list at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. You will get all the full interview transcripts, my ebook, 30 Tools to Start Up, where I talk about these free resources in show 006. You'll get the startup checklist, education and training materials, and other resources just by signing up at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. Back at MitchellChadro.com slash sign up, help me boost the rankings of the Listen Up Show, the Startup Entrepreneur Podcast, by providing a well-written review in iTunes. MitchellChadro.com slash iTunes. It helps other people find the show. If you actually need instructions on how to do this, you can find that back at MitchellChadro.com slash sign up. Thank you so much for subscribing to my email list and providing a written review on iTunes. Until next time.